whenever I begin planning a new project, I always think of the list of fullback games I have in the back of my head that I know I'll do a video on one day. It's not really a question of if I'll cover them, it's more of a question of when. You've seen some from that list already, like Stronghold and Future Cop LAPD, but the majority are still waiting for their time in the spotlight, like Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds and Supreme Commander. You might have guessed that today we're striking another off that ever shortening list, Command and Conquer Tiberian Sun. I have a long and storied history with Tiberian Sun, and as such the place for it in my heart remains to this day. Not only was it the first Command and Conquer game I'd ever played, it was also one of the first RTSs I'd ever played. It may have even been THE first, but my memory isn't quite good enough to remember if it was that, Age of Empires or Dark Reign. Some of my earliest and best gaming memories are of me and my best mate just playing Tiberian Sun together on a rickety old CRT monitor. Now I know the guy I played with watches these videos, you know who you are. It's a true classic, and it remains today as a fan favourite in the Command & Conquer series. While its predecessor laid the groundwork for what CNC would become, Tiberian Sun built upon all of its elements, and in itself became just as influential on the series' future. And of course, we all know what happened to series creator Westwood Studios, so it's always nice to go back and play a game that was made in their prime. Anyway, as 2019 marks Tiberian Sun's 20th anniversary, I thought it'd be the perfect opportunity to revisit it and decide if it's still worth playing in 2019. Having not played Tiberian Sun properly in at least 5 years, I found that I was really excited as I booted it up again. My memories of it were so fond, and sure, I'll be the first to admit that the rose tinted glasses were definitely put on as soon as I decided to make this video, however, after all these years, I found myself approaching it with a bit of a cautious optimism. I wondered if it would be nearly as fulfilling now as it was when I played it when I was a kid. But my fear subsided as soon as I hit that menu screen. Man, something about that just transports me back right to 2001 and makes me feel just like a kid again. Now, for some context and for those unaware, Tiberian Sun's narrative is set in a near future sci-fi setting, and it focuses on the second war between the Global Defense Initiative, or GDI, who are a UN style global earth government, and the Brotherhood of Nod, who are essentially a militaristic religious movement led by its charismatic leader, Kane. There's a surprising amount of backstory and history given to the world via the game's story modes, of which there are two, there's one for each faction. I began with the GDI, and upon starting the campaign you're immediately greeted to the series' staple full motion video cutscenes. I was really young when I first saw these, so I didn't fully grasp the deliberately cheesy tone they were going for, but boy did they pull off the B grade action movie aesthetic well. Whether or not it was fully intentional I can't say for sure, but everything from the CGI to the actors were gr- holy crap is that James Earl Jones? Voice of infamous sci-fi villain Darth Vader? Okay, well they definitely must have known what they were doing to get him on board. In truth I was really surprised about how long the cutscenes actually go for. Some of them felt like they were nearing the 10 minute mark and they give really great context to the missions and that would be sorely missed otherwise. There's an undeniable charm associated with these cutscenes in the story in general, and it persists throughout the whole game with an intriguing narrative that's helped by its acting and story delivery. And don't worry, we'll cover this more later, but right now, it's time for the gameplay. Now, for any of you out there who haven't played the older CNC games previously, it might be difficult to get used to the game's left mouse button does all system. But once you get over that, most things should come naturally to anyone who's played an RTS before. There's only one resource to gather, Tiberium, which your harvesters will gather automatically as long as it's available. So you can focus on what's important, building your base and going on the offensive. Established in the original Command & Conquer, Tiberian Sun sees the return of the sidebar, which allows you to manage the creation of all buildings and units for your faction, and it will expand as you build more advanced structures. It's a tidy and straightforward way to conglomerate everything in one place, but I do have a couple of complaints with this system. Firstly, it doesn't allow for any descriptions of the units and buildings you're creating, so you kind of just have to guess what each thing does, or what it will unlock. Things like the GDI barracks make enough sense on their own, but good luck trying to think of what the GDI tech center will allow you to build once completed. 
It's not a huge deal, and you'll obviously get used to it as you play the game more and more, but it's worth mentioning for newcomers. Once you have expanded your base, you'll find numerous options on what to construct and how to fill your armies. While having only two factions is a bit limiting, they're both quite unique and they really do feel like they're clashing opposites rather than variations on a shared core. One big evolution Tiberian Sun made from the original is that it moved the series into a much more sci-fi setting. So instead of being relegated to the boring, current day technology, generic modern military hardware, the Command and Conquer General story. Tiberian Sun features a vast array of futuristic weapons and equipment, like flame tanks, cyborg infantry, and laser turrets that turn soldiers into itty bitty bits of human popcorn. Both sides also feature some unique and powerful units where only one can be built at a time, like Nod's Cyborg Commando, or the GDI's Mammoth Mark II Walker. A wee side note here, while the Mammoth is really powerful and expensive, it's so tiny! I was expecting some kind of AT-AT size unit, not this cute little baby armadillo looking thing. The icon makes it look huge. It's the biggest bait and switch since Fallout 76's marketing. Four times the size. Clash against your foes is satisfying and engaging due to the many tactical options that the game makes available to you. There are stealth tanks and burrowing units that can traverse the map underground, aircraft that can bomb targets from above, vehicles that can change between modes like a tank that can transform into a stationary turret, and a variety of defensive structures like walls and cannons to use as a defense. And one RTS mainstay that Tiberian Sun doesn't really have are unit upgrades. And you can see that the UI doesn't really allow for it with its all-in-one-place style of layout. To make up for this, there is a basic unit veterancy system in place, though it's never really explained what it does or how to achieve it. And although some buildings can actually be upgraded with extra modules, it's kind of clunky in its execution and how it uses the use of the sidebar and how those upgrades are displayed exactly the same as a regular old structure. Overall, the combat in Tiberian Sun is fairly solid, with my only other complaint being that there's a general lack of feedback when you've got units in combat. Infantry don't really react to being shot at all, and vehicles will eventually just explode once they've taken enough hits, maybe after smouldering for a little bit. This is more of a side issue with the detail being so low in these older games, but it's worth mentioning. And while there's not really much difference in actual gameplay between the campaign or skirmish mode, building your armies and bases and engaging in combat is satisfying enough that playing without the context of the story still really is a lot of fun. In a vacuum, Tiberian Sun's graphics are clearly extremely dated. I could say it's aged as well as something like Age of Empires 2, but I'd just be lying. It's very clear that this game is 20 years old, and for some it may be a huge turnoff. However, when compared to its 1995 predecessor, Tiberian Sun was a huge graphical leap in terms of its environments, lighting, models, everything. It featured varying terrain levels to give the impression of a 3D landscape, dynamic lighting and day-night cycles, slick looking units that could transform between unique states, all things that don't seem that impressive nowadays, but at the time were definitely notable. And with that in mind, I can say that the overall graphical experience, while old, featured enough niceties and general quality to the point that its age can probably be overlooked by most people. While definitely limited by the technology it was built upon, the designers did a good job at making the unit and building design in Tiberian Sun diverse and visually interesting. All the different buildings are distinct and you can tell each one from the others without much of a second thought. And while some of the infantry units aren't quite so dissimilar from one another, the more powerful ones like the GDI Titan Walker or Nod Banshee aircraft certainly are. My only real gripe with the units is that there isn't much of a size differential between them all, so armies consisting of many units can sometimes just seem like a blob of different colours and shapes. Like the Armadillo, I mean Mammoth, Walker, should be many orders of magnitude larger than a stock standard foot soldier, but you can see here that they're quite similar in size. I mentioned this was a technical limitation more than anything else, but you're still need to suspend your disbelief for just a little bit. Tiberian Sun's audio package begins with its soundtrack, and as you can tell by listening to it in the background, it's really, really good. It fits the game's sci-fi themes absolutely perfectly, and nearly all the tracks are super memorable. It does a great job in setting the tone for the gameplay, and unlike the graphics, it holds up incredibly well today. 
You know what, it might even be my favourite RTS soundtrack of all time. And that's a pretty high price. And of course, we can't talk about a Command & Conquer game's audio-visual experience without spending a disproportionate amount of time on its full-motion video cutscenes. But let me mention that my one complaint with the audio of Tiberian Sun is that a lot of the units sound exactly the same despite being completely different. And okay, that's out of the way, time for the cutscenes. One of the hallmarks of the Command & Conquer series is its presentation of its campaign. And if you play at any of them except for Generals, you'll no doubt remember the campy as hell movies that come between missions to tell the game's story. And Tiberian Sun might just be the height of their execution. You know how people often commend a production with a limited budget for sticking to a small scale narrative in order to have all of its limited elements of high quality instead of spreading them too thin? Well, Tiberian Sun is the exact opposite. It's a globe-spanning tale with a limited budget, and while elements are definitely not the best in their class, they all fit the B-movie aesthetic they're going for really well, and I think that it's better because of it. And this applies to both the base game and the Firestorm expansion. You can really feel the effort the team put into all of its elements. Take Kane for example. You probably didn't know that Joseph Kukin, his actor, worked as Westwood's audio director. He began to experiment with video cutscenes in the original Command & Conquer, and happened to fall into the role of Kane that he would continue with for over a decade until the current end of the series. Kukin's portrayal of Nod's compelling leader adds a heck of a lot to the narrative, and he really does steal the show any time he's on screen. The time has come to claim this world as our own. The time has come to destroy GDI. One vision, one purpose. The other performances range from good to great, with the standouts in my opinion coming from Nod's frequently intelligent and in the Firestorm expansion, Rogue, AI, Cabal. I am the only salvation for the continued supremacy of Nod. It is my world now. Cabal stand down. <laughs> and this charming dude who presents Nod news, until his untimely execution that is. To put it simply, while the game is certainly old, its overall presentation has, in my opinion, stood the test of time. The graphics do hold it back somewhat, but the quality found in its cutscenes and especially its performances helped keep the game's campaign thoroughly engaging and entertaining. Despite being released two decades ago, the presence of Tiberian Sun can still be felt to this very day. Not only in the games that have taken lessons from its successes and failures, but also in the fact that people still play the damn thing. There's something about the Command & Conquer series that has kept nearly all of its entries relevant long after most of its contemporaries have turned to dust. Maybe it's their quality, maybe it's because of the amount of people who experienced one of its entries as their first RTS, maybe it's a lot of things. It's most likely a mix of multiple reasons, the secret source of gaming longevity if you will. One that's impossible to replicate if you try, and can really only come by by being in the right place at the right time. What's more impressive is its consistency through over a decade of game releases, all of which still have some amount of the remaining player base, except for Tiberium Twilight maybe. Tiberium Sun's legacy comes in a couple of forms, one of them being a community made online client that allows people to play multiplayer in just a few clicks, and the other being in some truly excellent mods. As for the multiplayer, the fact that EA made both Tiberium Sun and its expansion freeware means that anyone can download the game and the community client for free. The fact that it's so easy really is awesome, and you may need a couple of quick tweaks to run it on Windows 10 like I did. Overall, it's fairly simple and the client takes care of nearly all of the heavy lifting. It even works with the Origin version if you have that and don't feel like downloading the whole game again. You can get both the game and the online client at cncnet.org, and I'll put the link in the description for you all. I recommend you go check it out. And like a lot of classic RTSs, the mod scene for Tiberian Sun is alive and well. While it doesn't have the most populated list of community made content I've ever seen, the ones that are there are of high quality and in some cases have been in development for a long, long time. 
Now that's prominent almost certainly being Twisted Insurrection, a completely standalone mod that revamps the entire game with an entirely new campaign, new units, a new faction, and a ton more. It's a complete rework and the effort that's gone into it really shows. Every element of Tiberian Sun from its maps, voice acting, soundtrack, graphics, they've all either been updated, changed or improved upon. Hell, even the building construction animations have been amped up. The fact that it's completely standalone and free to download makes it super easy to give it a go. It even includes built-in fixes for running it in Windows 10 and all the other technical issues you may run into. It's definitely a passion project and the effort the team put in really shows. There are of course other mods available too, so check out the game's mod DB page and see if anything catches your eye, I'll link that below as well. You know how in my last Should You Play video I said that that script was the longest I'd ever written for an entry in the series? Well get that out of here, because we've got a new king in town. Contrary to my video for Middle Earth 2, I fully expected the script for Tiberian Sun's video to be this lengthy. The fanfare around the Command & Conquer series, my history and love for the game, plus its ongoing relevance made for a perfect storm of a video, and I really hope I've done it justice. Tiberian Sun was an excellent game when it was released 20 years ago in 1999, and while I can understand that nowadays it's fairly niche and definitely not for everyone, in my opinion it still holds up very well. I had a bit of a revelation about these videos recently. I realised that if I'm asking the question, should you play this game today, I need to specify who I'm asking it to. I'm not pitching this to Joe Gamer who plays Fortnite on his Xbox and only owns one copy of Skyrim. Pfft, weak. I'm talking about people who are already into the genre and would consider playing an old RTS because despite any flaws it may have, it's the type of game they enjoy. And it's my job to say if it's held up and if there's a better option available today. As an example, I wouldn't recommend the average gamer to play, say, Stronghold. It's an old title with bad graphics. But I would recommend it to those who are looking for a great RTS or castle builder. And there's of course going to be some that I wouldn't recommend to any player, whether due to technical issues, bad design, or just having flat out better options available to play instead. And of course, many issues can be overlooked in the name of nostalgia, I'm just generally speaking here. Tiberian Sun is definitely one of the former. While old, it's an experience that in my opinion is unique enough to warrant enjoying even in 2019, and there's really nothing quite like it. Its corny and charming FMV cutscenes keep the campaign wildly entertaining, and the exciting gameplay is quite unlike most modern RTSs that you might be used to playing, which may be refreshing in of itself. And playing it is just so simple. There are no ages to advance, no prerequisite research to do to get your favourite units, you just harvest the game's one resource and get down to business. And despite how simplistic it may seem on the surface, there's enough diversity in the structures, units and tactics that it manages to stay interesting throughout not just the campaign, but also its skirmish modes, whether you're playing against the AI or another person. And the fact that the game's free to download or cheap to buy on Origin, as well as being relatively easy to get working on a modern PC, means the barrier for entry is really, really low. Plus, you can play online matches with other like-minded people with surprising ease, or just mod the game for a completely different experience. There are more than a few ways to lose some hours here. This isn't even mentioning the nostalgia a lot of you watching probably have too, which will undoubtedly elevate your enjoyment even more like it did for me. I had a blast playing and enjoying Tiberian Sun again. And while it's a tad depressing to be reminded of the demise of Westwood, and to think what a hypothetical third game in the Tiberium series would have been like had they been given the opportunity to develop it and not EA Los Angeles, it's nice to be able to enjoy a game made when the studio was at its best. And remember the good old days, where the biggest problem you had wasn't work or taxes, but it was just trying to find a spot of the land for your CRT monitor, so you could preach peace through power in the name of Cain. Thanks for watching everyone. There's links for everything I mentioned down below, and there's also a link to my Twitter account where you can follow me for updates on the channel and upcoming videos. There's also a link to my Twitch channel where I'm doing regular live streams. Do note I'm away for the next month and I'll be back at the end of April as I'm doing some traveling and moving home. But YouTube will be as normal so you don't have to worry about that, there's a backlog in place, and the Twitch streams will restart around the 22nd of April or so. 
And for those wondering, I know I did say I was doing a retrospective on a beloved strategy game series today instead of this video, but something came up that is going to make that video a lot better, but it means I need to delay it until I get back home. So keep an eye out for that, it's going to be around the start of May. I'm really excited and I think you'll really like it. Again, thanks everyone so much for watching, and we'll see you all next time.